from his studios in New York. It's time for Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, where sports meets life. Here's your host, Dan Tortora. Welcome back here to Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on WakeUpCallDT.com, your one-stop sports shop, and on MixLR.com backslash WakeUpCallDT. We're at that part of the Monday morning broadcast, starting off Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora with our Monday morning quarterback. You know the moniker of the Monday morning quarterback, the, when a fan wakes up in the morning and they have their thoughts on what happened in the games on Saturday and Sunday and whatnot. Well, we took that moniker and turned it into something even more special, and that is having our Monday morning quarterback, the former quarterback of the Syracuse Orange, and in Syracuse's history at quarterback, somebody who I respect and, and appreciate very much so, and that is Mr. Marvin Graves, who is here with us every Monday morning to talk about Syracuse football in the first hour of the broadcast. So without further ado, let's welcome him back into the show. How are you doing today, Marvin? Doing great, Dan. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. And, and how was the weekend? What did you do over the weekend? Oh, man, I just kind of relaxed. Uh, I'm actually at the airport now picking up my wife and two of my kids coming back from Kentucky. Um, just hung out with my other two daughters and just got some rest and watched some football. So you got to watch football over the weekend. Do you watch the Army Navy game? Is that something that you put on the docket? Uh, I caught some of it. Uh, to be honest with you, I didn't see uh, the whole game. I just caught bits and pieces. But um, you know, the, the parts that I caught were were pretty uh, impressive. I did see at the end when both teams go uh, over to the corner, and I believe. Um, sing their songs i'm not sure what the songs are called but um you know pretty pretty uh impressive game man um i think army won the game uh they won it what three years in a row i believe yeah they won now three times in a row so the rivalry has heavily leaned on their side in recent history yeah so um you know those guys play hard man it's, it's a great football game like i said i was flipping channels so uh, watching some college basketball, which I really can't get into right now. Uh, but I know the Q's got a big win over my hometown, Hoya. So, um, yeah, I caught a little bit of it. And and you said that uh, Syracuse got a win over your hometown, Hoya. Just what that was like. I mean, I was at the game. I was on site, on location at the Carrier Dome. Uh, Tyus Battle hit a shot with uh, under six seconds to go and ends up winning the game 72-71. Uh, to 71. And was really, uh, in my opinion, his his coming out party of the 2018-19 season. What what do you think about? I mean, this rivalry is now. I mean, it stays on the side of Syracuse. 51 wins for Syracuse, 43 for Georgetown, head to head. You're in the D.C. area, so you know all about Georgetown, and obviously you went to Syracuse. So, what does this rivalry mean to you? Oh, it means a lot, man. It's, it's a big game. Uh, it's kind of sweet because I am a hometown team, but you know, I am I am a, a Syracuse guy, so uh, anybody that Syracuse plays against, um, you know, they're, they're enemies. So I was happy to see us get the win. I wasn't able to watch the game, so I kind of followed it on my phone as we were celebrating my mom's birthday. So um, I had I had the, uh, the score up, live score. When I turned it on, we were losing, and we got back to the game and the time I got home. Um, you know, and my phone uh, rebooted. Uh, I saw it. Rebooted. So um, it, it's a huge game. Uh, you know, Patrick Ewing is the coach at uh, Syracuse, so he at uh, Georgetown, so he fully understands what this rivalry is about. So I, I just hope it's something that we can keep going. And congratulations to uh, Bayheim and, and the basketball team. And and when you see that, like you said, when when Georgetown is is so close by to you, and then you know Syracuse is obviously where you have called home and a second home for you. When when you get to see that and you get to be around that, I mean, you get to have a unique experience of being connected to both. And you know that Patrick Ewing, like you just mentioned, was a big part of that rivalry with Pearl Washington and whatnot. 
It just, I mean, is that a game that you get up for especially? Are you are you purposely wearing all orange on those days when you're in D.C.? I mean, bring me into to game day for you. Are you the one that's that's out there wearing your uh, wearing your orange and blue when it's a Georgetown Syracuse game day? Well, I, I wear my orange and blue blue pretty much um, throughout the year. So um, you know, the people in D.C. that that know that know me, you know, they know I bleed orange because anytime we lose, whether it's basketball, football, lacrosse, they let me know it. So. Um, you know, I rock the orange and blue year round. Um, but like I said, you know, other than when we play each other, you know, I'm a I'm a Hoya fan. I'm a, a Maryland University fan. Redskins, Caps, Nationals. So, um, you know, they know me. I actually got on orange right now. So, um, you know, I, I pretty much rock it year round. That coming from Syracuse Orange quarterback alum Marvin Graves. Marvin, the Camping World Bowl, uh, big news came up this past week, uh, just a few days ago, that Will Greer has made the decision to not be the quarterback of the West Virginia Mountaineers in the Camping World Bowl. So this is supposed to be big-time offense West Virginia, big-time offense Syracuse, big-time quarterback Will Greer, big-time Syracuse quarterback Eric Dungy. They're supposed to go up against each other. It's supposed to be a marquee matchup. And then Will Greer makes the decision to prepare for the NFL draft as opposed to playing in the game. Your thoughts on that? Um, you know, me, me as uh, a competitor, um, you know, I, I, I can see it from both sides. Um, I think, you know, he making, he's making a business decision as far as I think he's put in the work to actually be considered one of the quarterbacks to be drafted pretty high in the NFL and, you know, to be looking at a paycheck like that, um, you know, I would really wouldn't want to do anything to, to hinder that. So, um, you know, if I can go back and be in a situation like that, um, I think I would make the same decision. I think the other good thing about it is, um, you know, you look at the quarterback who probably will be playing next year. Um, so this is a great opportunity for this guy to, uh, you know, get a game under his belt uh, for the fans to be able to see what uh, he can do, the coaches to be able to see what he can do, and he'll, and he'll end up playing on a big stage. So, um, you know, it's kind of – I can go either way with it. I understand it's more of a business decision. Um, you know, me personally, I, I would feel like I'm letting my teammates down. Uh, I, I think I would want to play in that one more game and just um, – you know, be as cautious as possible. But, um, you know, I'm not mad at the, at the decision. I'm kind of upset that, you know, we won't get to face them. Well, and that's the thing is if Syracuse defeats West Virginia, does it take anything, in your opinion, away from Syracuse if they win this game without Will Greer going up against them? I don't think so. You know, we don't, we don't make the rules. You know, we're just going to show up and play. And, you know, that's a decision that he made. I feel like we could have beat. We could beat West Virginia with him, um, you know. But again, you know, this is just football. Um, you know, the kid could have got gotten injured in the prep time to actually play in the game. Then what do you do? You still have to play your backup quarterback. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it takes anything away. Um, you know, we line up, we play the game, and you know, whoever lines up, that's who we're trying to defeat. So. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going out to win our 10th game of the season, and it doesn't matter who lines up across the ball from us. Speaking here with Marvin Graves, quarterback alum for the Syracuse Orange on this West Virginia upcoming matchup in the Camping World Bowl. Uh, you as a former quarterback, what is your stance on it's your final game, it's a bowl game, but you know you got a shot at making it in the NFL. What is your stance on guys going, you know what, I'm going to sit out the bowl game? Because uh, essentially, the bowl chooses these teams with the anticipation that the guys are going to be out there. The bowl obviously, you know, wanted Will Greer. I mean, Will Greer, the best player on West Virginia, the marquee player on West Virginia. So when the Camping World Bowl makes this decision and says, okay, Syracuse and West Virginia sounds good to us, you know, when, when this is going on and this is happening – there is that notion that, you know, obviously Will's going to be out there. So 
you know, the Camping World Bowl and Camping World Stadium and Florida Citrus Sports, they want to see Will Greer. And the fans want to see it. And in the rivalry, he wants to see it. So, you know, this decision was made thinking he's going to play. And then after the fact, him saying, you know what? I don't want to get injured. I want to prepare for the draft. What is your stance on that as a, as a former collegiate football player? Do you understand it? Do you get it? Do you, do you like the decision of saying, I'm going to focus on my future and not about my present? Well, like I said, as a, as a player, um, you know, I feel like he's pretty much lived up to all his obligations to West Virginia. Um, and if you have an opportunity to play at the highest level, which I never had an opportunity to do, um, you know, I, I feel like a player should have the ability to, to make that decision. It's business. Um, you know, the universities are uh, already making money off of the teams actually going, you know, to these bowl games. So um, I can I can see where um, I can go either way with it on both sides. If I'm, the, if I'm the bowl committee and we chose, you know, West Virginia to come, you know, I would be upset as well. But it's business, so you can't make everybody happy. And I, I feel like the kid has to make a decision which best for his future because if he gets hurt, uh, in the bowl game, is anyone going to pay him an NFL salary uh, after he gets hurt? No, they're not. So um, it's an unfortunate situation, but um, the game must go on. So you just have to have the next man up. I uh, applaud the guy for making a tough decision like that. But, again, I think it's a great situation for West Virginia to get a look at, you know, the quarterback that will possibly be playing next year. And so, I mean, they have a chance, obviously, to put somebody out there, like you said, and, and see that, you know, in the case of Eric Dungy, we know that Tommy DeVito is behind him in case anything were to happen to Eric, which hopefully it doesn't. But this is a year where Syracuse has actually seen their backup and their backups help them win a couple games. What do you think about the Tommy DeVito factor? I know we've talked about it a bit here on the show, but, you know, what is your sense of Tommy DeVito? Because he's a redshirt freshman. He's got three more seasons after this to be at Syracuse and to help lead this team. What do you think about what he's done so far as a former quarterback of Syracuse history? What are your thoughts on Tommy DeVito? I think uh, right now I feel like uh, the future is secure. Um, he's a different style quarterback uh, than, than Dungy. Uh, which will allow uh, Dino Babers, I'm sorry, and his, his offensive staff to actually um, maybe push the ball downfield even more. Um, he had a great career, I believe, at uh, Bosco, was it? Don Bosco? Yeah, he came from New and, Jersey, yep. Yeah, and, um, you know, the guy can throw the football. I mean, really look at it. It's, it, it's, it's hard to get a starter ready to play uh, Division One football, but when you have a guy that can come off the bench as a freshman and contribute uh, uh, to to a few big wins during the season, um, that's just a great situation to have. And then what it also does, it creates competition amongst the rest of the quarterbacks. Now my number three quarterback is saying, hey, you know, I might need to be ready to, 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 to take some snaps because um, they will play me. And you know, injuries happen, so um, I just think it's a great situation that he was able to, you know, get some snaps and meaningful uh, games. So next year, uh, or even in the bowl game, if, if uh, something was unfortunate to happen to Dungy or, you know, Dungy struggled in the game, this guy already has some, some snaps under his belt and he won't be uh, kind of like the hair, head and dare like type of player. So I think he's done a great job. Uh, and his time being here shows that he's prepared. And I think that, um, you know, that, that goes uh, that goes to um, the, the, the coaching staff. You got to give them some credit because um, everybody worked well together to actually be ready for, you know, those situations. And, it, and being ready for these situations, you know, you would imagine that the guy that would be behind Tommy DeVito is – cancer survivor and god bless him rex culpepper who is a native of florida who is from hb plant in tampa florida so this is kind of a homecoming for him as well which is kind of cool 
That is kind of cool. Um, you know, I didn't know that. Um, you know, it's just it's a great situation. Like I said, I didn't really know you know much about that, and um, you know, hey, you know, there, there's a great lot of great storylines in athletics, and um, you know, that seems to be one of them. When you think about, you know, kind of everything that's shaken out this season, you and I didn't talk about this too much, but Alabama 1, Clemson 2, Notre Dame 3, Oklahoma 4. Did the committee get it right? What do you think about the college football playoff this year? Uh, I mean, I think they got it right. You know, I mean, it's a tough situation to to actually – you know, narrow it down to four teams. So you, you got to go on strength of schedule, their whole little formula. Um, I I think they got it right. I think, you know, you got four, you know, powerhouse football teams in the playoff. And, you know, every year somebody's going to be left out. Uh, the only way it's going to get better is, you know, you add more teams. But then when you add more teams, you're still going to have people left out. So um, I think they got it right this time. Notre Dame does not play in a conference. Notre Dame is at the mercy of their schedule. They try to schedule, you know, tough teams and whatnot. They um they they won a close one against Vanderbilt, who wasn't good this year. They won a close one to Ball State. You know, we look at and and I'm not I shouldn't say wasn't good, but not in top twenty five. Vandy's not a top twenty five. Ball State's not a top twenty five. A lot of the games in Notre Dame won were close. The really the only blowouts they had were against Syracuse and Florida State, and Florida State's down this year. So, uh, what's your take on on that? Which is the Notre Dame Fighting Irish uh, to go twelve and zero and to not be in a conference and not have a conference championship game? Are they deserving of being in the college football playoff without being in a conference? So you don't have the strength of the conference. And you also don't have a championship game to help you decide things, like in the case of Alabama and Georgia. So, what is the ultimate thought for you on Notre Dame? Is it fair that they get into the college football playoff when they're in such a different scenario? I think that's definitely something that um, I look at because, to be honest with you, um, I don't want to take anything away from Notre Dame. Um, but I felt like if it was a team that was going to be left out, it would have been Notre Dame. Um, you know, again, it, it, it's hard to narrow it down to four teams um, when you're talking about um, a college playoff. You got guys that, you know, play at different conferences. Schedules are made, you know, I guess years in advance. So, <clears throat> You know, you're, you're just picking from what you feel like is the best teams in the country. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know how you fix it. The only way I think that you can is basically to add more teams and to structure it to where, um, you know, basically these college guys will end up playing probably about 14 or 15 games. Now, I don't know if that's something that's possible, but, you know, until it changes and – the structure of it is I don't think eight teams will, will, will make the playoff better. I think it has to be, you know, somewhere around 12 to, 12 to 18 teams possibly to actually be a true playoff. But then you're going to get teams like Alabama playing, maybe somebody with two or three losses. But that's what a playoff is about. So, um, you know, again, if it was a team that was left out, it would be Notre Dame. I probably would put Ohio State in. Um but outside of that, you know, they're undefeated. Um, they play, you know, some solid football during the year. And, you know, they're in. So, you know, that's what we have. Speaking here with Syracuse Orange quarterback alum Marvin Graves, and we're talking about the college football playoff. So you're pro-expansion. I am as well. How many teams do you expand to? Is it six? Is it eight? Now, there's the quote-unquote power five. And there's the notion of if you have the Big 12 champion, the Pac-12 champion, the SEC champion, the ACC champion, the Big 10 champion, that's five spots. You have eight, let's say, all together. So you got those five. Then you have the Notre Dame factor. Then you have the UCF factor. And then you got another wild card. 
What are your thoughts on the expansion? Is it six? Is it eight? Should it include all the winners of the Power Five? Should the group of five, a.k.a. the other five conferences, like the American Athletic and whatnot, have an equal opportunity or even an opportunity to get in? What's your sense of all that? Well, I think you you, you, you make it around. Well, I'll say this. You give the top two teams a bye in the first week. You know, you're going to have to forget about, you know, the 30 days or the month or whatever it is to prepare for um, the actual national championship. You give the first two teams a bye, and you let the other, I don't know, eight teams or 10, I'm sorry, eight to six teams play it out, and, you know, you go from there. But until you, um, I I just don't think it's going to work without, these two top teams actually getting a buy. Um, if they if they get a buy, you have to have around, I guess, ten to twelve teams, maybe. Um, if they don't get a buy, then I think you just shrink it down to, you know, maybe eight. Um, I, I really don't know the solution. I just know that every year um, there's going to be teams left out. Or the other thing you could do is you have, you know, two tier, you know, two brackets, you know, where you have a national champion. And I guess you have a tier two uh, national champion. So um, I don't think there's really uh, one exact fix, but um, I do think that it can be reconstructed to actually give other teams like UCF and um, Ohio State and a few other teams that have pretty good seasons, one, maybe two losses, uh, a chance to actually compete. And the other side, you know, and then to get back to Syracuse, this is a question that came up a bunch of times, and I want to address it with you. If Syracuse had defeated Clemson, and Syracuse was at the top of the Atlantic Division of the ACC and Clemson wasn't, do you put Syracuse into the college football playoff? Because it seems like, and the reason why I ask this, because to some people it's easy to say this, but... It seems like history, what you, what have you done for me lately, the coaches maybe, there seems to be a, a certain pull, and there seems to be a certain connection. So I live in the notion of if Syracuse did everything right, I, I still don't think that the bull, that the uh, college football playoff committee would put them in. What is your sense of this? If it wasn't Clemson and it was Syracuse, a, should they have put Syracuse in? And B, do you think they would have? Well, if, if Syracuse beats Clemson, then you got to look at the pick game. Do they beat Pittsburgh? If they lose, to, if they beat Clemson and lose to Pittsburgh, then um, I, I don't think they get in. I think the only way that Syracuse get in, if they beat Clemson, then they're definitely uh, somewhere in the top. I guess eight to six teams being undefeated. Um, I'm kind of with you. I still don't think they get in. I still don't think Syracuse get in at that point. I think there's, um, I agree with you. I think there's, you know, teams that have played in those big games, Georgia, Ohio State, uh, UCF's undefeated. Um, you know, there's a lot of other teams that, uh, that are out there that probably probably would be or the committee would consider better draws. Um, so Syracuse basically would have had to be undefeated to actually be in that conversation. And if they were, I still don't think we would have gotten in. And uh, see, that, that to me is showing a broken system because Alabama, I think, is the only team in the country that can lose two games a season – Anywhere from being undefeated to losing two games, they're still going to get in. In the case of Clemson, Clemson can lose a game, they'll still get in. Clemson could lose the ACC championship, still get in. Notre Dame, if they go 12-0, and they're going to be in the conversation. So is the system already broken because it's already kind of set up? Like you said, if Syracuse did everything right, they probably still would have been left out. And I agree with you. So what is going on with the system, and why should we be okay with a system where you and I both think 
that if Syracuse did what Clemson did, it still wouldn't have mattered? Well, I think they really need to take a better look at how uh, we're ranking the teams. Um, I, I, again, I think really the only fix to it and teams will still be left out is to expand it. Maybe maybe 10 to 12 teams is not enough. You know, maybe we need to expand it a little more. Um, like I said, you have, you know, I, I'd like to see Georgia in it. You know, Georgia played the best football game we've seen this year against Alabama and, you know, beaten by 14 and, and Alabama came back and won the football game. Georgia played Alabama in the national championship last year, had an opportunity to win. So, you know, it seems like that, that with the way the, the tournament is set up right now, that, you know, basically, you know, you're just going to be left out. It's going to be, you know, several teams that's left out. And the only way to adjust it, I don't think it'll be fixed, is to add more teams. But now you're adding more games, and then you run into situations like uh, West Virginia's quarterback where you got guys that are possibly, you know, looking at being uh, draft picks in the NFL that are probably not going to want to play in those games. So I don't, I don't really know what the solution is. Um, I, I really think the committee may be doing the best thing that they can, but I, I really don't think it's fixed, so to say. You know, like I said, Notre Dame's an independent team, and they, they've kind of been that way for a long time. I just don't think it's fair that, you know, they get in and a, a team like UCF, you're just looking at their strength of schedule. It's hard to win, you know, 12 games or whatever it is that they won go undefeated two seasons in a row and not even be considered. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a lot of parity in college football. I think some of those teams, you know, could give the Alabamas, the Clemsons, the Notre Dames, and, and the, the Oklahomas some go in these tournaments. But, you know, until they, they expand the teams, there's no way we'll know. Yeah, and I think that, you know, unfortunately we're in a position where expansion has to be the answer. It's going to have to happen, and that's the unfortunate of it all is that whether people like it or not, I shouldn't say the unfortunate, I want it to happen, but whether people like it or not, there's there's teams being left out all the time, and as you said, as you get bigger and bigger, you're going to still be left out. There's still going to be teams that are left out, but the reality of it all is, Four just doesn't seem to be enough, especially with the Power Five conferences and the SEC and the ACC getting the best look out of uh, any of the conferences that are out there. So, you know, the reality of it all is if the Ohio State's, and this is the thing, if UCF complains, I don't think they listen. But if Ohio State complains and West Virginia complains and Wisconsin complains and Washington State, and Washington, and Oregon, and so on and so forth. If teams like that start getting under the fingernails of the college football playoff, then we'll see some change. So, And that will inadvertently help out UCF. So hopefully people will be having to say some things right now, and these programs will be opening their mouths and asking and demanding for some change because this was a year where we could argue Georgia, we could argue Ohio State, we could argue UCF. So we're just in a different world right now. And I think that the best case for UCF is that some of these teams in these power conferences decide that enough is enough, and they call up the college football playoff, and they give them a piece of their mind, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, you know, it, like I said, it's a tough situation with football because, you know, you play 11, 12 games. It's a physical sport. I mean, people get hurt in all sports that, um, that exist. But, you know, I was just sitting here thinking, you know, maybe maybe the committee can create some type of bracket where, you know, these six teams or these eight teams play, these eight teams play, whatever the case may be. Maybe it could be, you know, four brackets. And then the teams that come out of that bracket can actually play each other. So a team like UCF, a team like Ohio State, team like Georgia, uh, teams with one, maybe two losses, um, that can get an opportunity to play for a national championship. 
And I, I think that we're in a position right now where I just want to see the teams be respected that are out there. That coming from Syracuse Orange football alum, Marvin Graves. Marvin, uh, before I let you go here, a, a final point to go back to Syracuse. Dino Babers at halftime of the Syracuse-Georgetown game stood out among the crowd with a microphone in the Carrier Dome at a basketball game. When he came into Syracuse, he did the exact same thing. He stood out on that court. I can't believe that it was a couple of years ago already. It feels like he did this last season. It feels like he did it yesterday. But he stood on that court, and he asked the fans to believe. He asked the fans to have – he said, please have faith, belief without evidence. So it's it's a very short time ago he asked everybody to have faith. And in just a few seasons – that belief without evidence has turned into a 9-3 and three team. What do you think about Dino Babers keeping his word? And what do you think about Dino Babers asking people to have faith and then working his tail off with this team to make sure that they gave you something to believe in if you believed in them, that, that there was that notion that things were going to get better? You know, I think you just have to give him his respect. You know, college football, I've said it, you know, over and over again, there's a lot of parity in college football. There's a lot of there's a lot of coaches out there that haven't had an opportunity uh, to be in the right situation. Um, I think you know when he first said that, I think that's probably what he really felt. But you never know how the journey's going to go. Um, but I think you know, two and a half years later, almost three years later, uh, for him to actually you know, make that a reality and, you know, look at it. Nine and nine and three, you know, you look at the two losses uh, that were very close that we could have won. You know, you're almost looking at a team that was almost in position to be in the top, you know, seven or eight teams in the country. So from where we came from, I, I believe we started the year this year at uh, what, ranked 80 something. And, you know, to finish in the top 25, to actually crack the top uh, 10, you know, I, I think, you know, the hat's off to him. And I think that, you know, we really need to get behind him. We really need to make sure that he has everything that he needs so that, you know, the program doesn't go backwards. So um, I think he's done a great job. You know, I've, I've watched it, you know, for the most part from afar. And, you know, I, I just see the camaraderie on the sidelines. I see, you know, his demeanor on the sidelines for the most part never change, and I think that trickles down to the team. And, you know, the results are are, are concrete, and, and we're going to play in a, in a bowl game where the fans will actually get an opportunity to travel to Florida um, that can afford and have the time to actually do it, to watch the team play one more time um, or in front of a national audience. So, you know, what more could you ask for? Um so I, I think the hats off to Dino and his staff and, and the kids, and I wish them luck um, going against West Virginia. And, you know, you got to be happy if you're an Orange fan. You, you have to be happy. There was only one game this year that, you know, the better team just showed up. The, the, the skies and everything were aligned for Notre Dame, and that was probably our worst performance. Dungy, you know, got injured. So it was their day that day. But other than that, um, you know, we won nine games. We were close to winning 11, and we're getting ready to play one extra one. So, um, great job by him. And, you know, what more could you want from somebody is to keep their word? If you don't have anything else in this world, if my word is good, then, you know, I should have access to a lot of things. That coming from Syracuse Orange quarterback alum Marvin Graves. Keep your word, your, the word that you have your word is the most valuable thing that you own. If you don't have your word, you have nothing. Those words were said by Floyd Little and echoed here this morning by Marvin Graves, both of Syracuse Orange history. Marvin, as always, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being on the show. I always love having you on to talk Syracuse as well as life in general and the sports world. And we always look forward to having you back on every single week. So with that being said, I look forward to speaking with you this coming Monday. And in the meantime, I hope that you have yourself a great week, that you stay blessed and stay safe, and that, uh, that all goes well and that we have plenty, I'm sure, to talk about the next time around, as we always do. But thank you for all that you do, and thank you for being a part of the show. 
Thanks a lot, Dan. And um, again, I appreciate you know you for having me on the show. Uh, it's a great way for me to uh, stay connected and you know to make sure as an alum that I follow uh, Syracuse sports as much as I can. And you know, Syracuse community has always been good to me. And um, I just appreciate being on the show, and I look forward to next week. Absolutely, brother. Well, looking forward to talking with you soon, and thank you for everything as always. Take care, man.